confusing timeline charts, cities in ruins, mega corporations conspiring to bring the end of the world, random petrified bodies, and the portrait of Todd Howard as Napoleon on a horse. Welcome everybody, my name is Lida Liberopoulou and in this video I'm going to say a few things about the first season of the Fallout TV show. There are going to be major spoilers ahead, you have been warned. First of all, I really like the show for what it is. I think that the aesthetics and the tone of the world are on point, and although it's closer to Fallout 3 and Fallout 4 for obvious reasons, uh, there are a lot of elements from the original games as well. But for me, what holds everything together is the characters and the acting. Walton Goggins as Cooper, Ella Prunell as Lucian, Aaron Morton as Maximus are just great. Even secondary characters like Moises Arias, who plays Lucy's brother Norm, or Johnny Pemberton playing Thaddeus do an amazing job. I even enjoyed the references and easter eggs, although I think they overdid it a bit. There are also some nice throwaway additions to the story, like the little mention about Robco purchasing a movie studio. Since Robco belongs to Mr. House, and Mr. House is based on Howard Hughes, this could parallel the takeover of Archeo Pictures by Hughes in 1948. I also like the whole interaction between Cooper and Sebastian Leslie, the actor who sold his voice to General Atomics for the Mr. Handy line of robots. It is a bit on the nose like most things on this show, but I think it still works really well. In fact, I enjoyed most of these moments where Cooper switches to memories from his pre-war life. I always wanted to see how America was before the Great War, and I think that they got the tone and aesthetics mostly right on this one too although I'm not exactly a big fan of the pre-war storyline. Of course, the show is not all Nuka-Cola victory and perfectly preserved pies. There are a lot of story elements that are contrived, don't make sense, or are outright annoying. And because I enjoyed the world and the characters so much, I would be willing to ignore almost all of them if it wasn't for this. <laughs> Yes, Bethesda considers the events of the show canon. This is unfortunate because I believe that Fallout fans would be far more positive towards it if it existed in its own little isolated universe. I'm not going to go into all the, let's be polite and say, surprise elements. I will just talk about the ones that really bugged me personally, and I will still try to take the most generous interpretation. First, a couple of small ones. Does anyone know what these are supposed to be? Nuclear explosions don't turn the human body into stone or compacted ash or whatever this is. They closely resemble the cast from Pompeii, but those weren't formed naturally. They were created by pouring plaster into the space between the ash layer and the skeletons of the volcano victims. Placing them outside Vault 33 seems silly to me. Also, what is this doing here? This is clearly a reference to the painting of Napoleon crossing the Alps by Jacques-Louis David, modified to look like Todd Howard on a horse you find inside the dugout inn in Diamond City. Why is this in the overseer's office? I mean, come on now! And here we get to the big ones. The one that annoyed a lot of people, and me, was the distraction of Sadie Sands. Seeing Lucy and Maximus standing in front of the ruins of the city was an unpleasant surprise to say the least. And then of course you have the debacle with the way the event timeline is shown in the Vault 4 classroom. I mean, uh, the fact that Fallout New Vegas is set in 2281 is not exactly a piece of obscure trivia. I can't understand how the same people who set up all these easter eggs and references looked at the label and the graphic that shows the progression of events and said, yes, this will make things 100% crystal clear. And so they ended up with days of confusion and they had to get Todd and Nolan to give a joint interview where they explicitly say that Sadie Sands is nuked after the events of New Vegas and that the game is still canon. Great job, everyone! But the destruction of Sadie Sands is shown together with the social collapse we see in the area. This, combined with the defeat of the remnants in the Griffith Observatory, gave the impression that the NCR has been obliterated as a faction 
and that civilization has been wiped out on the west coast. To be fair, the destruction of Sadie Sands and the possible eradication of the NCR was an option in the original games, but most uh, of the endings gave a positive or neutral outcome for the NCR, and the subsequent games had the positive outcome as the canonical continuation of the story. For me, that was one of the best parts of Fallout, the fact that uh, your actions in previous games had positive effects to the individuals and communities you interacted with in the next game. Todd also tried to answer the questions around this issue too, saying that we haven't heard the last of the NCR, but whether NCR still exists in some form doesn't alter the fact that the positive changes the player actions had brought to this part of the Fallout world are now gone and it has essentially reverted back to barbarism and chaos. This is probably the first time in the franchise history where the darkest outcome becomes canon. I really can't remember anything else in Fallout that does this. If you know of some other example, please mention it in the comments. We get a similar surprise at the end of the last episode with the view of the New Vegas Strip in the distance looking dark and abandoned. And again, some of the endings of FNV did hint to the probable destruction of the Strip and the general area around it. Also, almost all positive endings for New Vegas depended on the NCR being the main client and income source for its survival and development. If the NCR doesn't exist anymore or is too weak to allow its citizens luxuries like casino vacations, New Vegas will probably not be in the best of shapes. In any case, as with the destruction of Sadie Sands, the option to have New Vegas severely weakened or destroyed also negates most of the positive actions the player took while playing the game. And since we're on the last episode, we have to talk about the meeting scene. At the table, we see from Voltec, Barb Howard and Bud Askins, Mr. House for Robco, Frederick Sinclair representing the Big MT, Julia Masters, the CFO of Repcon, and Leo von Feldon, the head of FEV Research at Westec. I have so many questions about this scene, but I will just mention a few off the top of my head, like, uh, when is this taking place exactly? Since Julia Masters is there, it must be sometime before the 2076 acquisition of Repcon by Robco, so it is at least a year before the bombs dropped. Also, why are some of these people here at all? Frederick Sinclair, based on the Dead Money DLC, started doing business with Big MT after he saw the dispenser machines in the World's Fair, possibly the World's Fair that took place in 2075, which would make this meeting held sometime between 2075 and 2076. He used a lot of their technology for his Sierra Madre casino, but there is no mention of him being the owner, a big investor, or even an executive in Big MT. In fact, the Big MT scientists conducted their experiments on the Sierra Madre without him knowing about it. Also, why is Leon von Felden here? He was the head of FEV research at Westec, but is this enough to get him into a meeting about a major investment and collaboration? And why are these two allowed to have their peep boy with them? Why is this meeting held in a room that doesn't block things like radio frequencies and allows unknown parties to observe it? Why do the meeting participants even allow this to happen? This room has a very obvious observation deck above it and you can clearly see people in it. And why did these three C-level executives slash business giants even agree to this? Would Master Sinclair and especially House travel to Voltex location just to talk to some regional VP guys like Bud and Barb? Wouldn't they demand the C-level executives or owners of Voltec be also present for a negotiation of this level? Why would they enthusiastically start to suggest experiments that can be held in the vaults? What is being proposed here has incredible repercussions and so many unknown parameters, it would be insane to say yes to it so quickly, even if you were the sort of person that could contemplate it. Basically, this meeting makes some of the most established and powerful entities in the Fallout universe look like complete morons. 
It is also implied that someone from Voltex Top Brass is watching them. He could be Enclave since the games have shown that Enclave knew about the experiments, but the show is so fixated with this Voltec Megacorp conspiracy, I doubt it. Why is this guy just observing such an important meeting and lets his deputies handle it? Is it so he can claim plausible deniability if he's arrested for treason? Speaking of treason, there's of course the revelation that Voltec was planning to start the Great War and that the rest of Fallout's mega corporations went along with it. The Voltec did it scenario has been around for a while and to be honest I never liked it. It causes problems on its own and the show making the other mega corporations complicit in this conspiracy adds even more problems to it. At least Voltec planning to start the Great War doesn't necessarily mean that they fired the first nuke. We see that Cooper's daughter was not in a vault with her mom the day the bombs dropped, so this might be a clue to that direction. So there's still some hope that the show and future games won't go full in with this scenario. And then there's Mr. House. In FNV, he's portrayed as someone who always wants to have full control of his projects and aims at protecting his beloved Las Vegas at all costs. And based on what happened with Vault 21, he wasn't a big fan of vaults in general. So I can't see him going along with this vault tech proposal. Also, despite learning about this conspiracy, he still failed to get everything ready before the bombs dropped, which is very out of character for a perfectionist who utilized every piece of information to its fullest. So I'm not sure how this can fit with the Voltec did it scenario. But uh, there is an even bigger problem with Mr. House being here. The last episode focused a lot on Mr. House being in that meeting also, we see Hank McLean escaping to New Vegas and Cooper saying this. But there's always somebody behind the wheel. And that's who I want to talk to. So is it possible that Hank is trying to find Mr. House and we might actually see him in season two? If that is what's going on here, I would really question whether Mr. House would welcome someone who has destroyed his customer base and his chances of making New Vegas a technological metropolis. In any case, I hope none of this is going to happen. Unfortunately, as much as I enjoyed the show, based on how they handled the story and the setting, I don't think the screenwriters can write anything that can do justice to FNV. All of New Vegas was lightning in a bottle. The team that made it and the conditions that allowed it to be made do not exist anymore. It is a truly unique entry in the Fallout universe. The best thing that can happen to it is to be left alone. At this point, I hope that all of the game's original characters are long dead and whatever story and characters they write for season two, deal as little as possible with the story and characters of New Vegas. Maybe I'm completely wrong and season 2 will end up being the most intricate, nuanced and well-written story ever seen in the Fallout franchise, but I don't think that that's what's going to happen. Anyway, uh, despite my criticisms, I always want to have a positive attitude about these things, so I really hope I'm going to be pleasantly surprised by season 2. Uh, my next video is probably going to be a devlog on my history game, although I might do the comparison between the New Vegas Strip and the Golden Age of Las Vegas. If you like this video, please subscribe and Ave Atque Valley.